Own consultant, uh, welcome for uh, our webinar this morning. Uh, we have a lot of people logging on. We're actually expecting a very full crowd. So we're very excited to have all of you join us and share this exciting information. So let's uh, take care of just a couple of uh, housekeeping items. I have everybody on mute. Um, if you have any questions, there's a little chat icon up in the uh, top portion of um, the Join Me screen. So feel free to start asking questions. We're going to hold off on answering questions until um, uh, until the end of the presentations, and then we'll come back and see if we can answer as many as uh, as we possibly can. Um, we'll also have a survey uh, available to you, so uh, please take a few moments to fill that out, give us some feedback, and then there'll be some follow-up action items as a, as a result. So let's go over the agenda today. Uh, well, my name again is Will Johnson. I'm going to talk about renovation loans and then specifically drill in on how this applies to creating income and accessory dwelling units. And then um, I've had the pleasure of inviting uh, Caitlin Bigelow. She's been uh, involved with the development and advocating accessory dwelling units. She's here in San Diego. She's actually um, gone before the city council and played a role in helping reducing um, uh, some of the fees, specifically specifically here in uh, the San Diego marketplace. And then um, we have a marketing kit that is available. Uh, please stick around so we can talk about the benefits and the features and the promotions that we have available with the marketing kit to share with you. We see yeah. this as a Oh, I was just going to say thanks, Will, for having me on. And, uh, yeah, I think you guys are really going to like the marketing kit. Um, we'll have information on how you guys can get that at the end. And I've also included, in addition to what Will will be giving you, some free tools like cost estimator cheat sheets and granny flat lookbooks that I think you and your clients will find very helpful. Great. Thanks, Caitlin. So let me introduce myself again. My name is Will Johnson. I have a company called Inspection Perfection, uh, home inspection business since around 2005. In the 2008 time frame, I went through the certification as a HUD 203K consultant. So I'm certified from HUD to work with uh, renovation loans, both from HUD and, and Fannie Mae. So let's sort of talk about the value of renovation loans. It has some of the lowest uh, interest rates available for a construction loan, not for a home loan, but, but for a construction loan. So you'll be hard pressed to uh, find a better financing rate when it comes to renovating your property. Sorry about that. Okay, and then um, uh, one of the benefits of this is these loans talk uh, are based off of creating future value of the property, and I'll go into an example of exactly how that works. This also could be an important solution when we have tight inventory out there. We can actually create uh, solutions with uh, the given inventory that's available in the marketplace. For realtors and lenders, I think this is very important because this can be very empowering. We can literally overcome any kind of a physical conditions that we run into on any given inventory in the marketplace. It also fulfills a multitude of real estate needs, and that's part of the focus of my presentation this morning. This is more of an overview of how these renovation loans work meeting a multitude of real estate needs. We'll have future presentations available for people that really want to understand the process. And this is another important way to really distinguish yourself in the marketplace. Uh, being able to present these types of solutions will certainly put you in a unique position. I think you'll find that uh, with what I call the HGTV effect, uh, people are already sort of familiar with the possibilities of doing these renovations. They've certainly seen this available on the marketplace for years now. This really gives a huge marketing influence or push because that's already sort of set 
with a lot of your customers in, in the marketplace today. So let's sort of define what these renovation loans are. They're available from HUD and Fannie Mae. Uh, in terms of the top property types, uh, single family home units is really where I see most of these projects that I've been involved with, but they can work with condos and townhomes, manufactured homes, and even mixed use properties. So th there's a lot of flexibilities available with this program. And, and I guess that's the other benefit that I see of it. If you can see all of the flexibility in terms of the types of improvements that we can go into, and we'll go into more details of that as we go along. Um, I jumped spot here. It's available for purchase or refinance. So um, here's a couple of minor distinctions between the, the 203K and Fannie Mae. I think one important distinction is the PMI goes away on Fannie Mae's if we can protect a 20% um, uh, equity on the finished product. So that's an important distinction. I'll tell you with all of the refinances that I do, a majority of these are going Fannie Mae because of that condition. Uh, one other benefit of the, of the HUD program is it allows 110% of the appraisal. So that becomes very germane or important if we start running into some limitations on the improvement cost versus the value of the property. And then you can see at the bottom of the 203K, we can do pool repairs. Fannie Mae will actually allow you to install a new pool. Um, I've actually done that uh, a couple of years ago. One of the other important distinction about home style, if you just go to this bottom bullet here, is it does allow for investment properties. 203K is pretty is strictly um, allowed only for um, homeowners to, to purchase the property. So Fannie Mae does allow for uh, investors to participate in this program. So here's... Here's one of the important distinctions that I always want to share with clients on one of the benefits of these renovation loans. Um, sometimes if you're looking at doing these types of improvements, you can do an equity loan and, and basically allow you to pull out funds for a construction budget. But obviously it's going to be limited to the equity on the property. So one of the important distinctions about renovation loans is it is based off of future value. So when we go through the process, we're documenting what are kinds of improvements that are going to be done with the property and then handing that off to the appraiser to determine what future value is. So you can see how we can, in certain cases, dramatically grow the construction project to really enable people to finance the improvements that they couldn't otherwise do with, uh, with an equity loan. One of the um, important distinctions is anytime we're going through this process, we have a couple of new players involved on renovation loans and purchase and refinancing. We have to get a contractor on board. It's always important that the homeowner, home buyer take responsibility of selecting that contractor. That's their responsibilities. You can certainly make those kinds of recommendations out there, but I make it very clear for the homeowner to take the responsibility of selecting the contractor. And then my role as a renovation consultant, I sort of describe myself as a field consultant working with the contractor, home buyer, lender, to uh, make sure we're putting together a complete bid, that permits are being pulled, that is a complete and viable solution as we go forward in the marketplace. So here I'm talking about, here's the scenarios that I've seen in the marketplace doing these renovation loans since 2009, where I see these projects really sort of come to light and we're gonna go through these in, in detail. So the first one I call makeover, where we run into properties out there that we just have some finished condition issues, um, really lacking um, any kind of appeal whatsoever. It looks like immediately we have to do some improvements. But the improvements are somewhat affordable. They're sort of the finished types of improvements. 
and that we can, you know, immediately transform the look of the property by just replacing the finished improvements of it. You can also see that some of this can actually be done very affordably when we're just sort of concentrating on just replacing um, um, components in kind and how that this can add a very affordable um, uh, mortgage payment to it that's usually with, within people's budget and that, you know, this is something that, you know, the before and after difference can be dramatic and this is very, very affordable and appealing from a customer standpoint. And then we run into properties where, you know, homes have issues. They have some conditions that become very apparent from, you know, uh, onset of evaluating the property or they become discovered in the home inspection process. Um, we've referred to them as deferred conditions, and really this is sort of a point to really look at um, addressing this. And, you know, we could look at including the makeover components, all the finished improvements with these deferred conditions, and bundle that into a renovation loan. So when you're running through a purchase process, you don't have to stop because we can't negotiate, or sometimes you can negotiate um, um, a repair, but we can finance it through a renovation loan. And now we're making a home uh, safe and livable to enjoy for years to come. Here's another opportunity that I think really can sort of push the value proposition when we start to look at distressed property out there. So what happens in many cases is you're buying this at a discount, you're maybe only competing with cash investor types, uh, they're being very aggressive on their offer price, so it's not hard to step ahead of them. And then we can basically go through, do a complete renovation um, of the property. What happens in many instances, as I stated earlier, with the, um, the appraisal based off of future improvements, a lot of times customers realize before we close escrow that there's already equity in the property. So that's usually a nice benefit or surprise for people run into when they go after these properties. Um, I've seen very um, aggressive home buyers coming into the marketplace and they're looking for these types of property because they have that HGTV fever, they want to do a complete renovation, and then they can walk away with equity potentially before they even close escrow. Room additions are something also available through these loans. So we can add square footage to the property. So sometimes we'll have scenarios where we have a, a two, one, two bedroom, one bath. <clears throat> the client really needs an additional bedroom and or bathroom. So we can certainly accommodate that. In addition, um, this might be a future need. So maybe we can get the people into a two, one, knowing that they have a future need and knowing that they can come back and apply for a renovation loan um, down the road when the needs are there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Master suite is what I see a lot of in uh, my renovation projects where they're really, re they're, they're not interested in moving, but they really want that master bedroom suite. So that's probably a high percentage of the refinancing projects that I've been involved with is adding a master suite. Okay, and then we are um, granny, uh, room additions and then granny flats. So we'll talk about that here. I'm gonna bring Caitlin on board. Before that, I just wanted to go through you a couple of other uh, sustainability opportunities in the marketplace. <clears throat> some of these loans do require some weatherization. So we have to provide weather stripping and caulking and insulation. So if we stick our head up in the attic, there's no insulation. That's actually going to be um, a requirement. In this day and age and what we've experienced with um, uh, weather patterns that we had here in August recently, that you know this is becoming more and more relevant. <clears throat> SDG&E has planned announcements of increasing their rates. So energy efficiency is becoming more and more relevant and, and becoming mandatory. There's also an option available from HUD and Fannie Mae. It's known as an energy efficient mortgage. 
So what that allows you to do is allows a homeowner to stretch their budget, um, increase what they can borrow from for doing energy efficiency improvements as long as they're cost effective. So that's another opportunity that's available for these loans. And then um, I'm very familiar as an energy auditor with other rebates that are available that we can also take advantage of. So um, let's talk about income properties here. I just want you to know that uh, these are available through HUD and Fannie Mae. You know, some of the demands that I see out there in the marketplace is, is for income and investment purposes, help offset mortgage payment, create income, diversify your investment portfolio. So I think this is a good way to really um, stretch your portfolio into real estate. One of the other uh, attractive advantages is um, the construction costs versus rental income and value. You'll see that there's opportunities there. You'll see that there's oppor opportunities there to really create some value with the property. And then uh, granny flats. So we're going to turn this over to Caitlin. Uh, ADUs are allowed with uh, with these construction loans. So bear with me one second. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Caitlin, and she's going to take it from here and present her um, her presentation on accessory dwelling units. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, appreciate you guys all being here. Um, can, Will, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So my name is Caitlin Bigelow. I am the founder of Maxable Space, which is a company based in San Diego that helps connect homeowners to the resources and education they need to build a granny flat. So as a lot of you probably know, there's been some really big legislative changes that has really blown open the market for this kind of thing. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the opportunity. And then I've got some great free tools that I'm gonna to give to you guys at the end of this uh, that I think you're really gonna like, that'll help you know, if you're interested in building a granny flat or you have clients that are interested in this kind of thing, it's gonna be a, a, a really fantastic tool for them. So let's dive into it. So in San Diego, you know, and a lot of what I'm talking about is specific to San Diego, although these trends that we're gonna talk about you know, are occurring in Los Angeles, they're happening in the Bay Area as well. So there's kind of this perfect market in San Diego right now for Granny Flats. So we have favorable legislation. Um, there was a huge fee reduction in San Diego, which is something that I was kind of campaigning for and working with Chris, uh, Councilman Chris Ward's office on. Um, and so that was recently passed and it went into effect about a month ago. So that's gonna save homeowners on average $17,000 in permitting fees. So that's a big deal. Uh, and then just a hot housing market. People are excited to invest in their properties. They see a lot of potential. They have a lot of home equity. Um, and so kind of these three things really lead to a market that supports ADU development. Um, and when you hear me say uh, ADU, accessory dwelling unit, or Grammy flat, I'm gonna use them interchangeably. Um, just to kind of define that term for everyone, it means a it means a kind of like a standalone apartment. So it would have a kitchen, uh, a bathroom, its own entrance, um, and it has to exist on a single family property. So that could be a converted garage, it could be attached to the main house, it could be a standalone unit in the backyard. So just so you kind of understand what what I'm referring to when I use that term. So looking at market opportunities in San Diego, these numbers are really astounding. So it's estimated that the, that the population in San Diego will increase by a million people by 2050. And you think, wow, where are all these people gonna live? And that was really part of the motivation um, for the Senate bill that was passed in 2017 is the state is seeing that there's huge population increases happening in major California cities, and we just don't have enough units of housing. You can see by our rental vacancy rate that that's 3.3%. Uh, the Bay Area has a similar rental vacancy rate. LA is a little bit higher. Um, but the reality is, is that we just do not have enough units available for rent. So that means that people who are willing to put a granny flat in their property 
can really maximize an investment because rents are very high and there's just not a lot of inventory. Um, so this was a, an article that was ran in the Union Tribune recently saying how San Diego had uh, broken another record on rents and you can kind of see the trend there on the right um, and they're saying, you know, will it last? And the answer is probably yes, because we don't have enough units of housing and there's even more people that are planning on moving to the city. So, you know, kind of looking at that, you can assess how this could be a really uh, advantageous investment for people. So I just want to cover something on the Senate bill because I think this is something that really trips people up and they get confused about how this works. So what happened in January of 2017, California passed Senate Bill 1069. And essentially what that bill did is it wiped out and made all of the local jurisdictions ordinances around accessory dwelling units null and void. So all, all these different jurisdictions had extremely prohibitive regulations around this. Um, you know, for example, in Pasadena, they were requiring lot sizes of 15,000 square feet to be able to put in a granny flat. Or there were things that you had to you had to replace parking and it had to be covered and it could only exist on a certain part of the property, which would make it impossible to allow. Um, and so the state said, you know what, we're faced with an affordable housing crisis. We need more units of housing. We're wiping out all of this, all of your local jurisdictions and we're replacing them with a common sense state standard. Uh, now, all of those local jurisdictions, so La Mesa, San Diego, Chula Vista, Imperial Beach, Lemon Grove, all those places are allowed to write their own ordinance that would replace the state legislation, but they only can control certain things. So they can say, you know, we, well, we're gonna require owner occupancy. Uh, well, we don't want short-term rentals. But they can't do things like say, oh, well, your lot size has to be 15,000 square feet. So it, you know, the, the state law, and, that, and that's why I think it's tricky for people because, you know, what your friend in La Mesa is doing could be different regulations than what your friend in Del Mar is doing. So each jurisdiction is going to have their own ordinance. And a lot of the jurisdictions in San Diego have passed their own ordinance, kind of outlining specific things. So it's really important to understand from a neighborhood to neighborhood basis what it is that you're allowed to do. And that's something that Maxwell can help you with if you have questions about that. So let's just kind of look at San Diego at a glance. So, uh, you know, for example, Del Mar, Coronado, El Cajon, Encinitas, San Diego, Solana Beach, and Oceanside have all said, you know what, if you build a granny flat on your property, you cannot rent this short term. And a short term rental would be defined as um, you know, uh, less than 30 day rental. Um, some or some jurisdictions have passed owner occupancy requirements, which is really unfortunate. Um, I think owner occupancy requirements are really ridiculous because if you think about, you know, if you have an owner of a duplex, they're not required to live on the property. Um, so that's a restriction that really makes it difficult um, for people. If you think about you know, kind of the uncertainty. Maybe your wife gets a job somewhere else and you guys want to move. Um, then hey, Caitlin, you might not. Uh-huh. Yeah, just one quick comment. Uh, can you tell us where City of San Diego stands on owner occupancy and then where the uh, county is going with, uh, with their um, um, requirements? Sure. So San Diego does not require owner occupancy, uh, and I do not see that changing. So the city has passed their ordinance. Um, you know, I think that it's uh, fairly set in stone at this point. Um, if anything, there were some bills that were working their way through the Senate and the House that unfortunately got shot down that would actually ban owner occupancy for any granny flat in the state um, and didn't pass. So, um, you know, the Senate is still looking at ways to make this more for people. But as of right now, these are the only jurisdictions that require owner occupancy. And just to define that, that means that the owner would either need to live in the main house or in the accessory dwelling unit. So you would not be able to legally rent both, both units out at the same time. Uh, okay, let's keep moving here. Um, some other, so this, the places that don't have a local ordinance, 
So La Mesa, Lemon Grove, Imperial Beach, National City, Poway, and San Diego County are all still operating off the state standard. So all of those jurisdictions are gonna have the identical same regulations, and it's all gonna be based off what the state mandated. So theoretically, those uh, jurisdictions are gonna have some of the most lenient um, you know, rules and regulations for granny flats um, because they haven't passed their own ordinance yet. Uh, I had a conversation with the mayor of National City a couple months ago, and they are interested in passing their own ordinance and he wants to mandate owner occupancy. So, um, you know, the, these jurisdictions are still looking at passing their own ordinance, but for whatever reason, they haven't done it yet. Um, there are also some size restrictions in San Diego County. So for example, Carlsbad has said you cannot build larger than 640 square feet. Um, Del Mar has size restrictions. Uh, El Cajon, Escondido, and then Vista, they have a requirement of a minimum lot size of a quarter acre, which sounds overly restrictive, but the average lot size out in Vista is quite large. So um, it, it ends up not really being very restrictive. So that's kind of to give you guys an idea of what's going on in San Diego. Those are some of the big ones. Obviously, there's some other things at play, but that kind of gives you an idea. Caitlin? So I was just going to share that San Diego County is actually looking at um, an ordinance and there's some meetings coming up in October that I was aware of. So this is just a good example of, of staying tuned and in contact with, uh, with us to keep you informed of how these uh, provisions roll out. Absolutely. And I would expect that within the next year or two, most of the jurisdictions will have passed an ordinance. Um, sometimes there's some disagreements on the council about, you know, what the ordinance should entail, and there's some difficulties, like, for example, L.A. has not passed their own ordinance. L.A. and L.A. County have both are just going off the state standards because there's a lot of um, uh, debate going on about what should be included in the ordinance. So you'll see these get updated, you know, as months go on, but that's kind of where we stand right now. Um, so here's some questions that people tend to have around accessory dwelling units. Like, first of all, can you build an ADU on the property? So the number one thing to look for is that it's zoned for a single family. Um, if it's zoned for single family, the chances are that you can build an ADU on it. The only reason why this would not be the case is if the property is part of an HOA where the CCNRs uh, prohibit this kind of construction. So anything like that is going to overwrite the state. So if you're in like a gated community that doesn't allow this, then unfortunately you're out of luck. Uh, how much does this cost to do? So homeowners are always really shocked at what the cost of construction is in San Diego and, and elsewhere. And Bay Area is even more expensive to construct. L.A. is fairly similar. Um, but uh, you know, you could look at a uh, garage conversion being in the seventy to $100,000 range. Uh, if you were putting in a very simple uh, small unit in a backyard, you know, standalone unit, maybe four or 500 square feet, you could probably do it for, you know, I would say those units are going to start at 120000 or 150000 depending on the square footage and go up in price from there. Like I'll show you guys in a little bit, a really fancy $300,000 accessory dwelling unit. It's really beautiful. Um, but the thing to think about when you hear kind of this like shock from the price of like, oh my gosh, it costs, you know, $300 a square foot to build. That's crazy. Um, but you want to think about it in terms of what is the return on your investment? So what I tell homeowners to think about is if you live in La Jolla and the average cost per square foot is $650 a square foot and that's what homes in the area are selling for, you can think about this as adding square footage to your house similar to an addition, for example. So if you can build for $300 a square foot and the property and your property is worth $650 a square foot, you're really building equity in your house and investing in your property, not to mention the ability then to have a really wonderful, flexible space that you can use for family or passive rental income, for example. 
Um, so, you know, I, and that's a nice way to kind of frame it and think about it. Um, will the property cash flow, you know, this is something investors are kind of interested in. Obviously, it's a, a big important factor for them. That's going to depend on the neighborhood in which you're building. Um, obviously, how much construction costs are, you know, what your loan terms are, that kind of thing. And then Will has kind of talked, covered a bit about the finance. That renovation loans are a, are a great way to finance a project like this because it can be based off the future value of the property. And I'll mention too, uh, for those of you that have questions on, you know, something I'm saying, feel free to write it in the comments and I will be happy to cover some of those questions at the end. So here's a property that's on that's for sale right now. I found this on Zillow yesterday. Um, so if you're looking for a property with ADU potential, what should you look for? So, uh, you know, here's a small craftsman, um, and I wanna show you why this has great ADU potential. Um, so first thing I do is Google Maps is your friend. So what I do is I always type the address into Google. I can see that the property is, or the house is situated on the front of the property. It's a very deep lot, which is great because you can maintain some privacy um, between, you know, if you were to build on the back half of the lot, you could maintain a little garden or some privacy between the main house. The other thing I really like about this property is it's on an alley. So you can actually see that there's cars parking back in the alley right now. The reason why that is great is that you don't have to have anyone walking you know, through or by your main house. You can have them pulling into the back and then entering their unit from the back. Uh, another thing that I want to mention about it is if it has a detached garage, that can be low hanging fruit for creating an accessory dwelling unit. The reason being is obviously there, there's already construction done there. But one of the great things about garages is that if it's an existing permitted structure, like a garage, you can convert it into an accessory dwelling unit and it doesn't have to conform to setback requirements. So a lot of garages are built on property lines. And if you are converting your garage, you don't have to conform to the setbacks. So that's a big advantage for people. Um, if you do convert a garage, you have to replace the parking that you're cannibalizing by, you know, building the unit. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, even if you are in that transit zone. So you guys probably know that if you're within half a mile of public transit, you're not required to add parking for your accessory dwelling unit. But if you if you convert a garage, you are required to replace the parking you took away. So if you convert a two car garage, you need to add two parking spaces. Um, oops, I skipped a slide there. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, I like looking at this view as well on Google Maps, just because you can kind of see where the property lines are. They're not 100% accurate, but again, it's just like another thing you can take a look at. Um, and, uh, you know, I like being able to see this view as well. This is a case study I wanted to share with you. I have a friend who's an appraiser who specializes in accessory dwelling units, and he shared this case study with me. This is a property that he had appraised out in Santee, and he had estimated that the income loss without the ADO at the time of the sale would have been close to $300,000. So that number really blew my mind um, because you can see it's not like this is a particularly fancy looking unit. Um, and so I asked him to send me that slide over so I could include it in my presentations as well. And then I wanted to show you guys a couple of kind of inspirational examples. Um, this is actually a standalone garage in Seattle. Um, you can see it doesn't look like anything special. Uh, you know, you wouldn't even look at it twice. They spent about $110,000 converting it. It's 480, 480 square feet. Um, and this is the after. So they put in a beautiful bathroom, um, really nice guest quarters, and they rent this out on Airbnb. And so they are generating around $3,000 a month of rental income using, you know, using this as an Airbnb. Uh, and it was estimated that they were going to have this paid off in three to four years. Um, and they actually subdivided the unit and turned the other half into her um, home office. And so she had a really lovely, nice home office as well. So she's kind of an idea of what is possible here. 
this is maybe my favorite uh, accessory dwelling unit I've come across. This one is built in Austin, Texas. This is a $300,000 project. Um, it's 1,100 square feet. And it might sound a little obscene to spend that much on an ADU, but in Austin, the real estate is really interesting. You can actually subdivide the lot and sell the accessory dwelling unit separately. So uh, people out there are building as large as they can build. And uh, there's a lot of investors kind of cashing in on that trend as well. Um, so, and, and in San Diego, you can build up to 1200 square feet. I mean, that's a nice size house. So, Here's the inside. You can see really modern, energy efficient house, um, lovely kitchen and some really nice kind of architectural flourishes on the railing and stairwell on the inside of the house. And we have a ton of ideas, um, design ideas at Maxwell Space. So I would encourage you if you guys are interested in ADUs to check out what we offer there and take a look because there's we've done a lot of case studies. Um, we have a lot of projects up there. Um, and then I also wanted to, as a thank you guys for joining this webinar, um, I have some free tools I'm going to make sure that we send to all of you so you can look for an email from Maxible, um, including a granny flat lookbook, a cost estimator and cheat sheet, and some other things that are going to help you and your clients kind of understand what's possible, how much it's going to cost, kind of get some of your initial questions answered. I also wanted to mention that we do have consultations available. So we do free 10 minute consultations for homeowners who are interested in, in um, you know, building a granny flat in their backyard. Um, we have service providers that we can recommend working with that are specialized in this. Um, and then we also do, you know, phone and on site consultations. So uh, I go out to properties frequently and meet with homeowners and that's a $200 uh, fee. And typically what we'll do is walk through your specific property. I'll let you know all about the permitting. We can talk about, you know, what structure makes the most sense, talk about tax implications and how to maximize, you know, tax benefits if you're building something. Um, just a lot more of the kind of nitty gritty stuff. So, so yeah, that's, that's that. So I'm going to turn it back over to Will because I know he's got information on, um, the marketing toolkit that we're going to give you guys, and then also um, do some Q&A, which I think we've got some um, questions coming through here. So let's see. So if you're con someone asked if you're converting a guest house, if the setback requirements no longer exist. So um, any existing permitted structure you would be able to convert into an accessory dwelling unit. Although um, it's a little bit tricky with guest houses because um, it is possible in San Diego to do that. There, the building, the ordinance had specified that you would not be able to convert guest houses, but they're actually in the process of changing that right now. And I'm working with a client who is getting their guest house permitted and it's gone through the permitting process now. So it's a little bit tricky. And again, I just kind of want to stress that's why it's so important to work with people who specialize in this. Um, the architects that we recommend um, and the modular builders we work with have experience in this specific thing. Um, and so I've run across a lot of horror stories where people have used you know, drafters or people who didn't really have experience in this kind of thing, and they ended up spending tens of thousands of dollars that they shouldn't have had to spend. Um, so, um, so, let's see. Okay, we've got a couple other questions. Are there specific areas where ADU potential is the easiest? Um, so, in those jurisdictions where there aren't ordinances passed, um, San Diego is a great place. They are pretty lenient in Diego um, to build a granny flat and San Diego County as well are pretty good places. Um, Encinitas is really playing ball um, with uh, being able to build accessory dwelling units as is Chula Vista. Um, as far as harder ordinances, Coronado is very difficult. Uh, La Mesa has been dragging their feet, making things okay. difficult for homeowners. Um, so that is, uh, you know, something to think about. Um, how does Vista get away 
with a lot size minimum. I thought the state had ruled against that. Yes, yeah, so this is allowed to get away with that because it's not overly restrictive. And the average lot size in Vista is quite large. I think houses out there are ranging from one to two acres and on average. I don't know, don't quote me on that, but the lot sizes are quite large. So mandating a quarter acre has to do also with the fact that a lot of the houses are on set, some of the houses are on septic. And so it's a little bit of a tricky situation, but basically um, they were allowed to do that because the state said, well, this isn't an overly restrictive ordinance. Most of the lot sizes in Vista are larger than a quarter acre. Um, someone said, does the city of San Diego develop set plans that allow pulling a permit the same day? No, they don't. Um, one of the things I'm working on, I'm part of an ADU coalition um, and we are trying to create some policy that we're advising Mayor Faulkner on. And one of the things that we're working on that I'm really optimistic about is called the accessory dwelling unit master plan process. And what we're trying to put in place is that architects would be able to submit um, kind of templated plans and homeowners could choose from a library of pre-designed plans um, and that would actually cut down dramatically on the permitting process. So right now on average permits are taking about 14 weeks to pull for an accessory dwelling unit, which is a really long time. And so we're working on a process where, um, you know, people would be able to choose from these templates, these master plans, which I think would be really fantastic. Not only would it cut down on the amount of time it would take to pull a permit, but it would also be a cheaper option for homeowners. So that's something to kind of, um, you know, make sure you stay plugged in with Will and I so that you can stay up to date on those kind of developments because there's a lot happening in this space that's changing. Um, but right now, that's still something that's kind of in the works. Um, someone said, what is the average time frame from start to finish for permitting and construction? Um, so, you know, it depends. If you're going modular, it could be faster. Um, generally, I would, depending on the complexity of the project, I would expect it to take anywhere from 8 to 12 months. Um, someone asked about San Marcos specifically. Uh, I don't know that I have any information specifically on San Marcos. I haven't heard that they're overly restrictive. Um, they do have their own ordinance, so that's something that you could look into. Does anyone else have any other questions? All right. I'm not sure. Someone asked if there's an existing non-permitted space, but I'm not. Oh, I see. If you're trying. OK. If you have a uh, unit that was built illegally, was not permitted, you have to go through the same building code um, and bring it up to building standards that anyone who's creating new construction would have to do. So it is possible um, and it really the intricacies and how difficult or complicated that is really depends on how it was constructed. So for example, if you had an unpermitted structure that was built, you know, into the setbacks, the city essentially is going to say, okay, you need to chop that wall off and make it conform to setback requirements. So, you know, it could be not that difficult if everything was built to code and you complied with setbacks and, you know, you have your firewall built in and um, you know everything if things were kind of done a little more haphazardly and you know you weren't paying attention to that kind of stuff then it can be a little bit of um it can be a little bit of a difficult project um, that's certainly something that we can help you with if you are interested in getting something permitted so Would you be able to consult a client from the beginning to the end of construction? Um, so right now we really work more with the beginning phase um, 
you know, we could talk if there's a specific situation, but if you're hiring the right team and the right architects, which is kind of what we've put together for people, we're offering kind of a full stack solution where, um, you know, we are telling homeowners, okay, these are, these are all the best people to work with in San Diego. And if you're working with those people, you know, you probably won't need to have guidance from us through the whole process because at some point, your general contractor and your architect are going to kind of take over there. Uh, of course, we're always available for consulting and to help out. Um, if it's an already permitted habitable space, do you still have to bring it to today's standard? Um, I would need to see the situation. I'm, I don't want to say no um, and be incorrect there. So that would, I think, would, it would kind of depend. Um, okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for sending in your questions. And again, I'm going to send out some great tools for you guys. And I'm going to hand it back over to Will, who is going to tell you guys about the marketing kit that we'll be sending out. Thank you, Caitlin. Great information. Um, I wanted to share with you that uh, we have um, three projects, ADU projects, that um, I've been working on with um, uh, clients through the renovation loan process. And um, I tell you, there's a lot of inconsistent information, sometimes even working with the building department that, you know, you know the process. Sometimes we're not getting consistent information, so it's important to have an advocate with somebody like uh, Caitlin that really understands what the process is and can help set this um, in the proper direction. So I think it's very valuable. I think she's a great starting point through the process. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you. Um, Going forward, you know, we want to work with uh, real estate professionals out there. This is a great opportunity in the marketplace that we don't see come along very often. And uh, there's just an awful lot of pent up and interest and demand in this. The numbers work. So there's a lot of interest and in customers trying to implement this. So what we wanted to do is, is put together a marketing kit so you can immediately go to market and engage uh, your customers. So we've put together some, um, some collateral that we can customize for you, send us your logo, your contact information, and now you'll have a talking piece that you can immediately start talking to customers um, in general about, about renovation loans. So um, we're not going to make you an expert today, but this will certainly get the dialogue going. If there's interest, then you have myself that you can immediately engage into, um, into further discussions on what the next steps are for renovation loans. What I've also noticed is uh, um, a lot of real estate professionals sometimes struggle with maintaining contact with their existing customer base. and. I know from my previous sales experience that there's opportunities with your existing customers. So uh, we've actually stepped up and became a solution provider for constant contact. So we've put together some customized collateral um, and made this very easy for you to immediately engage with your, your clients. Uh, a lot of you are, are aware that, you know, you need to continue to create uh, touch points and brand awareness out there. One of the nice benefits of email marketing is uh, once you send out your, your initial drip campaign, it immediately can identify people that have opened um, your email and even clicked through. So what this does is this shows helps identify people that are immediately interested in your topic. And now you have a list that you can work with. So this becomes sort of your hot list. So what have we done? We've taken this, this you know, database, identified people that are showing interest in the content, and now we can create an action plan where you can immediately reach out and, and, and follow up with a warm phone call. So uh, what we're offering is um, free content. Uh, by becoming a um, constant contact um, uh, subscriber, that you have this contact information. 
I like constant contact because if we can get your database into a spreadsheet, we can immediately start deploying this information out there and help you identify these clients um, and, and narrow down and immediately engage with them and work with them on, on helping them provide some solutions. The other benefit is, is by engaging with these contacts, this creates you an opportunity to identify whether you see any future real estate activity sales going on where these clients you're going to find out maybe retiring, maybe relocating, downsizing. This creates an opportunity to for you to really um, identify any other real estate opportunities with your existing clients. And then along with um, this email marketing campaign, this actually creates content. So now you can deploy these to your social media presence and contacts and Facebook and LinkedIn and another point. So, you know, this is becoming more and more, um, I think, sort of required in terms of, of uh, real estate and, and uh, loan officers sort of creating brand awareness and creating new um, uh, clients through your social marketing activity. So um, we're sort of wrapped up here. Uh, I wanted to put my information and Caitlin, and I don't know, did we see any other um, questions come up? Caitlin, I think I can see. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to unmute you. Hang on. <laughs> okay, Caitlin, are you there? Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, someone had asked a question about taxes, but we just kind of answered that in the comments. So, um, yeah, we have, you know, I wanted to thank you guys again for joining us. And like I said, um, we'll definitely send out information for you guys and, uh, and appreciate everyone joining us. Yeah, thanks, Caitlin. Um, we have a survey that's going to follow uh, this presentation. This is a good time to give us some feedback on your thoughts of the presentation itself. But there's also some questions talking about financing opportunities. Um, what I've discovered in putting this presentation together, um, I've had lenders approaching me. I've had contractors. I have architects. I mean, we have really are putting together a solid team to work with you and any types of questions. So we'll be able to assist you from the initial process where Caitlin would be involved through the entire construction process. If that's not obvious um, in the renovation loans, I do sort of manage fund distribution. So in, if we're involved with the renovation loan, I am involved into completion. So that does bring a level of uh, quality control through the um, through the process. So thank you again for all of your attendance. We had record crowd as we had anticipated. Uh, this is a great opportunities that I don't think comes along very often. So we're here to support you, uh, create the demand out there in the marketplace. And when you have those opportunities, we can support you every step of the way. Caitlin, thank you so much for joining us today. That was a lot of great, valuable information. We really look forward to your leadership driving these processes through San Diego County. Yeah, I'm, this is a wonderful space to be in, and I'm I'm really excited about the connections between homeowners and real estate agents and lenders and architects and nonprofits too in San Diego. So anyway, um, yeah, again, thanks everyone. Okay, thank you. Signing off, please, um, please follow up, uh, respond to the surveys, let us know how we can support you. Thanks again. Bye-bye.